How does dropping air pressure make fish uncomfortable? I think it is highly suspicious. Hey, welcome back. The barometric pressure affects fishing, and here are two very popular versions explaining it. Now, theory one says changing barometric pressure changes the size of the swim bladder of a fish. Now, dropping pressure leads to expansion of the swim bladder and makes them bloated, thus uncomfortable. And vice versa, high pressure system shrinks the size of the bladder and making them feeling more comfortable. And theory two says. When low pressure system is moving in, fish will rise to shallow water and become active because they can feel the storm is coming via sensing the pressure drop. Now, so here you can already see these two theories are pretty much contradictory to each other already. And one says low pressure makes them uncomfortable, while the other says low pressure makes them active. Now, I have yet to observe any uncomfortable animal become active, unless the uncomfortable part. Is the neural system? <coughs> the barometric pressure is essentially how much weight air puts on us. The atmospheric pressure at sea level is close to a constant, or 760 millimeters of mercury, or 29.9 inches of mercury, or 101.3 kilopascal, and these are just different units. And this sea level air pressure we can call One atmospheric pressure or one atm. No, 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 no. This atm is not the same as the one in front of a Bank of America. Now, air pressure frequently changes. When a storm moves in, the barometric pressure usually drops. When a cold front moves through, the barometric pressure usually rises. Now, fish, however, lives in water, and just like air, water also creates a pressure. And the pressure is proportional to the density of the fluid, so water puts out a lot more pressure than air. And in fact, every 10 meters or about 33 feet of water generates pressure equals to 1 atm or 29.9 inches of mercury. Every feet or 0.3 meters of water depth change results in about one inch of mercury or 3.4 kilopascal pressure change. Now, when a typical summer afternoon storm pops through, the pressure will typically drop about 0.1 to 1 inch of mercury before the storm, which is equal to about 1.5 inch to roughly one feet of water depth change. Now, for a hurricane, it's much bigger drop. Now, 2005, October 19th, Hurricane Wilma hit Mexico. Its center pressure measured at 88.2 kilopascal. Making it the lowest ever pressure recorded for an Atlantic hurricane. Now the pressure drop in the center of Hurricane Wilma is about 13 kilopascal, which equals to the pressure change created by 3.8 feet of water depth change. And this is about the biggest change the air pressure could implement in reality. So 3.8 feet of water depth change. Remember this number. Now, when fish are swimming, they can quickly swim in shallower or deeper. And for a two-pound bass that's 16 inches long, its body height is about five inches, give or take. Now, remember, during a summer tea storm, the pressure drop was in the range from 1.5 inches to about 12 inches for water depth change. So, at most, the air pressure change is only about, you know. 2.5 times of its body height. So the problem here is when fish swim, they don't always keep completely precisely at one depth, and definitely not to the inches. So the amount of hydrostatic pressure change or the water pressure change, when it just slightly alters the depth for a couple of inches, will exceed the typical tea storm air pressure change. And in addition, fish don't really have a barometer. They don't know if this small pressure change is actually caused by water depth change or by air pressure change. So theory number two, which states they could sense the air pressure drop in many many cases, especially under those very small air pressure drops, does not really make too much sense. And in fact, the fish as it swims is feeling constant pressure change, not mostly via the sensors in their lateral line.、Uh, they sense. These drastic and quick pressure changes all the time, so they are used to the pressure change. 
and talking about sensing the pressure change, now their swim bladder does play a role, and that's what we're going to look at next. <clears throat> And the gas bladder or the swim bladder is filled with gas to help adjusting the fish's buoyancy. So average density of a fish is around 1.06. And this is calculated by dividing their weight over their measured volume. And this density is more dense than water or even some of the seawaters. Now without the gas bladder, fish will actually sink. Now like this shark, um, well, this is not a shark. I don't have a shark. Now it does not have gas bladder. Now, the average density of a shark is around 1.03, so roughly the same or maybe a little more than the seawater in some places. So the shark is going to slowly sink like a fine-tuned jerkbait. And that's why it needs to constantly swim to stay up in the water column. And for fish like bass, they can use the swim bladder to adjust their overall density to very close to water density. And once they do that, they can easily suspend, thus saving a lot of energy to maintain at that water depth. But when depths change, say if they swim three feet deeper, the pressure will increase about three inches of mercury. And the increase of pressure will make the volume of the gas bladder smaller, thus increase the average density of the fish to be higher than water. And the fish will turn from suspending to slow sinking. So if the fish wants to maintain at any depths deeper, it will need to keep swimming to maintain depths just like the shark. This will burn a lot of energy. But a lot of a fish, including bass, is built with a mechanism to regulate the blood to release gas into the gas bladder or vice versa. Now by releasing gas from blood into the gas bladder, the fish can make the bladder filled with gas until it reaches about the same volume or same size before. Now at that point, fish become neutral buoyant again, and it will be able to suspend again. Now most people think fish will need to release gas to go deeper, but actually they only need to swim deeper and then they will be on the way like we run downhill. But to stay neutral buoyant in deeper water, it will need to fill more gas into the swim bladder. And this might sound counterintuitive, but this is how physics work on fish. And the name of this piece of physics in play here is called Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law essentially means as long as the amount of gas or the number of molecules of a gas does not change, then the product of its pressure with its volume under that pressure is a constant. So one very cool thing we can do with Boyle's Law is to estimate the size change of a bass swim bladder when it swims deeper or shallower or move into a dropping air pressure system. In the center of Hurricane Wilma, the swim bladder of the two-pound bass will be about 10% larger due to the pressure decrease caused by the center of Wilma. Now the swim bladder volume of a two-pound bass is approximately 25 to 30 mils, or about two tablespoons, or 10% of that is about three mils, or about a little over half a teaspoon, which is a fairly small volume. And actually, most crawdad and bluegill, even after fully digested, or AKA turning to poop, would probably be more than half of a teaspoon. <laughs> And don't forget, in weather systems, air pressure does not change in a split second. The big low pressure systems often take hours or even days to reach the lowest pressure. The fish has their own mechanism to regulate the gas in the swim bladder, which we just talked about. So the bottom line is, if for a two pound bass, half of a teaspoon's volume change in swim bladder over the course of hours, to tens of hours is going to make it really uncomfortable. Then what happens when it takes number two? And furthermore, let's say, okay, it does feel discomfort. And remember the fish can still swim. So in the center of Hurricane Wilma, our two pound bass only needs to swim about four feet deeper and the pressure decrease will immediately go away. Okay. So what if 10 feet is the bottom of the lake and he cannot go deeper? 
Now don't forget, BAS still has its mechanism to regulate the gas bladder as well, right? So over the course of hours to tens of hours, it should be able to at least alleviate a lot of the so-called discomfort during the time period. And after all, the example we used here is the extreme example. And in most of the low pressure systems, we don't have a barometric pressure decrease as high as Hurricane Wilma. So the discomfort theory, talking about a swim bladder size change and blah blah blah, to me, does not make too much sense either. Now another theory will say, dissolved oxygen at low pressure will impact the fish activity. Now it is true that lower barometric pressure will lead to lower partial oxygen pressure and less dissolved oxygen in water. However, again, the loss of oxygen from water to air is a fairly slow process. At the same time, wind, chop, current, and aquatic vegetation and plankton's photosynthesis all add more oxygen into water. Now, wind and chop is very common before many low pressure systems. So the net oxygen loss due to pressure drop usually is minimal. So again, how does dropping air pressure make fish uncomfortable? I think it is highly suspicious. I never heard fish talk about it. Or maybe it's just because I don't speak fish. Now, we've already analyzed the impact of a barometric pressure has limited direct impact on fish. But you might be still wondering, now we do generally observe that fish are more active before a low pressure system. They tend to bite better or tend to react to moving baits more before a low pressure system. While they tend to shut their mouth at those post frontal high pressure days. Now, what are the reasons of these behaviors? I generally agree that these are very frequently observed fish activities before and after a cold front, but the reason could very well be something else. Now, why does barometric pressure change? It changes with the altitude and temperature. But very importantly, the barometric pressure changes as its composition changes. Now, in the air, there are oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, some noble gas, Peter's fart. <laughs> Gentlemen, that was a fact. <laughs> and last but not least, moisture. The moisture has a density lower than the average density of oxygen, nitrogen, CO2, and Peter's far. When temperature gets higher, more water evaporation takes place, and more moisture gets into the air, making the air pressure drop. Now, at the same time, moisture due to its lower density will float up to sky high where it meets colder temperature and condenses into tiny droplets flying high or aka clouds. The clouds move in in front of the sun and blocks the sunlight and then we get cloudy gloomy days. Now this is called a low light condition. Now you can go back and recall your best efficient days before a tea storm or low pressure system. Oftentimes, it was a cloudy day or gloomy day. When wind is also in the mix, now this is when fish are really turned on. They go into a feeding frenzy, gouging themselves. Now we've all seen fish activity turning on during dusk or dawn, and this is very similar to those low light conditions. Now the other evidence is how quickly the fish will respond to the so-called low pressure system. And as I mentioned, the pressure decrease usually happens through hours or days. But the activity of fish turns up very quickly under low light conditions. So the low light could very likely be the actual reason why fish are active before a low pressure system. Now they happen to occur together very often. And we just happen to only associate the fish activity perhaps inaccurately with the pressure decrease, but totally forgot about the low light conditions. Now, why is it very hard to catch them under bluebird sky post the front? The bluebird sky, no winged, these high light conditions are 
commonly considered not the best for bats to ambush or chase. So again, due to the light conditions. But also I want to add, if they actually put on a feed bag before the front, now with the high light condition, bright sunlight, no wind, and a full stomach, I guess for feeding, you will have to have some kind of motivation or degree of empty stomach to accommodate the food, right? So it's like we talk about a spawn. What is the number one requirement for bats to spawn? Not temperature, not moon phase, not daylight lens or like sunlight angles, whatever. Now it is the eggs and the sperms. Now female bats need to develop mature eggs to be able to spawn. Males need to develop sperms or milt. Or in other words, for a male bass, his balls are not always hanging there. It's seasonal. So if it's not eating well enough, or if it's sick or have passed a certain life events, then he does not get to grow his balls that season. Okay, back to the post-frontal condition. Other than the highlight conditions, I do believe that sometimes the pressure do have more impact post the front because it is quite common actually that the barometric pressure could rise very quickly post the front. They might be full in stomach and really do not need to actively move too much after all the feeding activity. So that is when finding a perfect neutral buoyance means a lot to them to save energy and sit there and digest. And this is when you can see sunfish suspending. And remember, they only need to swim up a feet or two to regain the neutral points under the higher pressure systems. Now about pressure, I don't think a lot of the theories actually make too much sense, but I'm also not completely dismissing it. For now, I think a lot is actually pointing to a less direct effect, but more of a light change effect which accompanies the low pressure system. Now this is what I believe for now. What do you think? Maybe we should all wait and have the fish rule it out? But well, with that, this concludes our video today. Now if you like more of this type of content, please do not forget to hit that subscribe button. Now thank you for your time, tight lines, and I'll see you in the next one.